Okay, it's time for a new book, Law and Liberty, R.J. Rushduni. And guess what? It's about law and liberty. Wow, amazing. So here's the plan. I'm going to hit the record button. No, I'm going to hit the record button. And we're going to give it a go. One, can we legislate morality? An oft-quoted statement has it that we can't legislate morality. We are told that it's useless and even wrong to enact certain kinds of... Le le <clears throat> we are told that it is useless and even wrong to enact certain kinds of legislation because they involve trying to make people moral by law, and this, it is insisted, is an impossibility. Whenever various groups try to effect reforms, they are met with the words, You can't legislate morality. Now it must be granted that there is a measure of truth to this statement. If people could be made moral by law, it would be a simple matter for the Board of Supervisors or for Congress to pass laws making all Americans moral. This would be salvation by law. Men and nations have often resorted to salvation by law, but the only consequence has been greater problems and social chaos. We can agree, therefore, that people cannot be saved by law, but it is one thing to try to save people by law, another to have moral legislation, that is, laws concerned with morality. The statement, you can't legislate morality, is a dangerous half-truth and even a lie because all legislation is concerned with morality. Every law in the statute books of every civil government is either an example of enacted morality or it is a... or it is procedural there too. Our laws are all moral laws, representing a system of morality. Laws against manslaughter and murder are moral laws. They echo the commandment, Thou shalt not kill. Laws against theft are commandments against stealing. Slander and libel laws, perjury laws, enact the moral requirements, Thou shalt not bear false witness. Traffic laws are moral laws also, their purpose is to protect life and property. Again, they reflect the Ten Commandments. Laws concerning police and court procedures have a moral purpose also, to further justice and to protect law and order. Every law in the statute books is concerned with morality or with the procedures for the enforcement of law, and all law is concerned with morality. We may disagree with the morality of a law, but we cannot deny the moral concern of law. Law is concerned with right and wrong. It punishes and restrains evil and protects the good. And this is exactly what morality is about. It is impossible to have law without having morality behind that law, because all law is simply enacted morality. There are, however, different kinds of morality. Biblical morality is one thing, and Buddhist, Hindu and Muslim morality radically different moral systems. Some moral laws forbid the eating of meats as sinful, as for example Hinduism, and others declare that the killing of unbelievers can be a virtue, as in Muslim morality. For Plato's morality, some acts of perversion were noble forms of love, whereas for the Bible, the same acts are deserving of capital punishment. The point is this, all law is enacted morality and presupposes a moral system, a moral law, and all morality presupposes a religion as its foundation. Law rests on morality and morality on religion. Whenever and wherever you weaken the religious foundations of a country or people, you then weaken the morality also and you take away the foundations of its law. The result is the progressive collapse of law and order and the breakdown of society. This is what we're experiencing today. Oh, it's a little bit too Shatner-esque to be looked over. <clears throat> this is what we're experiencing today.
law and order are deteriorating because the religious foundations, the biblical foundations, are being denied by the courts and by the people. Our system, our American system, Our American system of laws has rested on a biblical foundation of law, on biblical morality, and we are now denying that biblical. Biblical. I like it. And we are now denying that biblical foundation for a humanistic one. From colonial days to the present, American law has represented biblical faith and morality because it has been. Biblical. What is talking about? From colonial days to the present, American law has represented biblical faith and morality. Because it has been biblical, our laws have not tried to save men by law, but they have been. But they have. But, but they have. But they have. But they have sought to establish and maintain that system of law and order which is most conducive to godly society. Now, our increasingly humanistic laws, courts and legislators are giving us a new morality. They tell us, as they strike down laws resting upon biblical foundations, that morality cannot be legislated, but what they offer is not only legislated morality, but salvation by law, and no Christian can accept this. Wherever we look now, whether with respect to poverty, education, civil rights, human rights, peace and all things else, we see laws passed designed to save man. Supposedly these laws are going to save... Supposedly these laws are going to give us a society free of prejudice, Ignorance, disease, poverty, crime, war, and all other things considered to be evil. These legislative programs add up to one thing. Salvation by law. This brings us to the crucial difference between biblical law and humanistic law. Laws grounded in the Bible do not attempt to save man or to usher in a brave new world, a great society, world peace, a poverty-free world, or any such world's peace, a poverty-free world, or any other such ideal. The purpose of biblical law, and all laws grounded on a biblical faith, is to punish and restrain evil, and to protect life and property, to provide justice for all people. It is not the purpose of the state and its law to change or reform men. This is a spiritual matter and a task for religion. Man can be changed only by the grace of God through the ministry of his word. Man cannot be changed by status legislation. He cannot be legislated into a new character. The evil will or heart of a man can be restrained by law in that a man can be afraid of the consequences of disobedience. We all slow down a bit on the freeway when we see a patrol car and we are always mindful of speed regulations. The fact of law and the strict enforcement of law are restraints upon man's sinful inclinations. But while a man can be restrained by strict law and order, he cannot be changed by law. He cannot be saved by law. Man can only be saved by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. Now, humanistic law has a different purpose. Humanistic law aims at saving man and remaking society. For humanism, salvation is an act of state. It is civil government which regenerates man and society and brings man into a paradise on earth. As a result, for the humanist social action is everything. Man must work to pass the right set of laws because his salvation depends upon it. Any who oppose the humanist in his plan of salvation by law, salvation by acts of civil government, is by definition an evil man conspiring against the good of society. The majority of men in office today are intensely moral and religious men, deeply concerned with saving men by law. 
from the biblical perspective, from the Christian perspective. Their program is immoral and ungodly, but these men are, from their humanistic perspective, not only men of great dedication, but men of earnestly humanistic faith and morality. As a result, our basic problem today is that we have two religions in conflict, humanism and Christianity, each with its own moral. each with its own morality and the laws of that morality. When the humanist tells us, therefore, that you can't legislate morality, what he actually means is that we must not legislate biblical morality because he means to have humanistic morality legislated. What on earth? Why are we not recording? What? each with its own morality and the laws of that morality. When the humanist tells us, therefore, that you can't legislate morality, what he actually means is that we must not legislate biblical morality because he means to have humanistic morality legislated. The Bible is religiously barred from the schools because the schools have another established religion, humanism. The courts will not recognize Christianity as the common law foundation of American life and civil government because the courts have already established humanism as the religious foundation of American life. For humanism is a religion, even though it does not believe in God. It is not necessary for a religion to believe in God to be a religion. As a matter of fact, most of the world's religions are essentially humanistic and anti-theistic. The new America taking shape around us is a very religious America, but its religion is humanism, not Christianity. It is a very morally minded America, but its ethics is the new morality for which Christianity is simply the old sin. This new, revolutionary, humanistic America is also very missionary minded. Humanism believes in salvation by works of law, and as a result we are trying, as a nation, to save the world by law. By vast appropriations of money and dedicated labour, we are trying to save all nations and races, all men from all problems in the hopes of creating a paradise on earth. We are trying to bring peace on earth and goodwill among men by acts of state and works of law, not by Jesus Christ. But, St. Paul wrote in Galatians 2.16, quote, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Law is good, proper, and essential in its place, but law can save no man nor can law remake man and society. The basic function of law is to restrain, Romans 13, 1-4, not to regenerate, and when the function of law is changed from the restraint of evil to the regeneration and reformation of man and society, then law itself begins to break down, because an impossible burden is being placed upon it. Today, because too much is expected from law, we get less and less results from law, because law is put to improper uses. Only as we return to a biblical foundation for law shall we again have a return to justice and order under law. Except the Lord build a house, they labour in vain that build it. Psalm 127, 1. Study questions. No. No study questions for you, Jimmy boy. Jiminy, Jiminy boy. Flippity flap. Okay, let's, uh, original. Let's go for chapter two. Let's go. Two, the sanctity of life. One of the more prominent thinkers of this century and a famous humanist was Dr. Albert Schweitzer. By his own statement, Schweitzer was religiously not a Christian, but a humanitarian, His basic religious principle was not Jesus Christ, but reverence for life. For Schweitzer, reverence for life meant that all life is equally sacred and holy, and equally to be reverenced. 
I'm just going to swizzle this about a bit. Swizzity swizz. And I'm going to take a wee drink of water. 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 Lovely. Hope you're doing well. Hope you like the shirt. I think it's pretty rocking. I could be a cholo. Main. The life of man and the life of a worm or a mosquito. The life of a saint and the life of the most depraved criminal are equally sacred and equally to be reverent. Revered. Revered. And equally to be revered, any killing even of plants and animals for good, for food. Schweitzer, the, uh, the, the, the grandfather of veganism, maybe. Any killing even of plants and animals for food is a guilty act of murder, so that man lives by guilt only. There can be no moral discrimination between men or between living things, because all equally represent life, and all life is sacred and holy. In varying degrees, this belief is widespread in our times. Many hold that capital punishment is murder, a crime against life, and that all warfare is murder, and therefore totally to be condemned. Moreover, the new morality refuses to distinguish between moral and immoral acts in the biblical sense. All acts are held to be moral, which do no violence to life. Life is holy, and there can be no discrimination against any acts which is an aspect of life. People who hold to this faith are almost always pacifists, although some will justify the killing of fascistic enemies of humanity. They are against... <coughs> They are against capital punishment and they are against Christian morality because they claim it is restrictive of or hostile to life and the will to live. To cope with this very prevalent faith, it is necessary to know the biblical perspective thoroughly. The plain statement of the Ten Commandments is, Thou shalt not kill. The meaning of this commandment is that God as creator is Lord over life and death, quote, See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill, and I make alive. I wound, and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. Deuteronomy 32, 20. Shut up. That's what I say. Deuteronomy 32, 39. Life is a gift of God. It must therefore be lived on his terms and according to his law. Man cannot take life, including his own, according to his own wishes, without being guilty of murder. In many states, our law still reflects the Christian belief that attempted suicide is attempted murder and a criminal offence. Our life is not our own. We can neither live nor die according to our will, but only according to God's will and word. As a result, the death sentence against murder is repeatedly pronounced in the Bible. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Genesis 9, 6. He that smiteth a man shall that... He that smiteth a man... He that smiteth a man so that he die shall be surely put to death. Exodus 21, 12. The murderer shall surely be put to death. Numbers 35, 16 to 18. Murder, thus, is one of the crimes that calls for capital punishment. But some have argued, how can the Bible logically ask us to impose death as a penalty when it also forbids us to kill? The answer is a simple one. The right to kill does not belong to man. It belongs to God as the author of life. Life can be taken capital punishment imposed only according to the law of God and under commission from him. Repeatedly, the Bible tells us, for example, in Romans 13, 1-6, that officers of states, civil government officials, are ministers of God. 
just as the Church represents a ministry of the Word and of the sacraments and of Church discipline, so the state or civil government represents a ministry, the ministry of justice, the administration of law and order under God. Moreover, just as the officers or ministers of the Church must believe in and be faithful to God, or else incur his wrath and judgments, so also must the officers or ministers of the state believe in and be faithful to God, or else incur his wrath and judgment. Because the officers of state exercise God's power, that is, the ministry of justice, with the power and right to take life, they are spoken of by God as Elohim in Psalm 82, that is, as God's. They are like God's in that they share in God's authority over human life. To them is delegated the duty of killing men when men violate God's laws. When they discharge this duty according to God's word, their judgment is regarded as judgments of God. According to Deuteronomy 117 in its instructions to civil officers and judges, quote, Ye shall not respect persons in judgment, but ye shall hear the small as well as the great. Ye shall not be afraid of the face of man, for the judgment is God's. End quote. If the judges and officers of civil governments fail to keep God's laws, if they pervert God's justice, then, according to Psalm 82, although their authority is like the authority of a god, they, quote, shall die like men, end quote, Psalm 82, 7. God himself will bring judgment and capital punishment on a country that despises his law. As a result, from the Christian perspective, capital punishment is not an option of the state, not a matter where civil government has a choice. The state has an ironclad law, the law of God, which it must obey, because the execution of criminals who incur the death penalty is required of the state at the penalty of the state's own life if it disobeys. The rights of the criminal are protected by biblical law, the legal principle that a man is innocent before the court until proven guilty is derived from the Bible. The same is true of the requirement of corroboration before a testimony is allowed to stand against a man. But the Bible makes clear that man proven guilty cannot be the object of pity. As Solomon summarized it, quote, They that forsake the law praise the wicked. <clears throat> you swallowed something. <clears throat> They that forsake the law praise the wicked, but such as keep the law contend with them. Proverbs 28.4 Those who are full of pity for the guilty criminal are themselves men who have forsaken the law. Their pity for the criminal is itself a sign of depravity. A few years ago, the father of a six-year-old girl who was brutally slain by a sex pervert said, I can't blame the man as much as the society which produced him. The criminal was clearly a degenerate man, but we must insist that this father himself was fearfully degenerate. This father was denying the doctrine of personal moral responsibility. He was turning the whole moral world upside down by calling the criminal the victim. He was despising God's law in favour of various sociological excuses for criminality. Solomon expressed clearly the consequences of such moral delinquency. Quote, he that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. Proverbs 28 9. The power to kill, thus, is God's power. It must be exercised according to God's law, and it is not man's power, but God's power. This godly use of the power to kill is, according to the Bible, also involved in just warfare. But this is only one side of the matter. The power to kill is under God's law, and life and living are also under God's law. Nowadays, it is popular to think of laws as a restraint on life, and this is an attitude widely encouraged by existentialist humanism. The free life is the life beyond law, beyond good and evil. We are told it is emancipation from law and morality, our historic American position, however, has been the Christian faith that true liberty is under law, God's law. Godly wisdom, which means faith and obedience, is, according to Scripture, quote, a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her. 
Proverbs 3.18, compare 11.30. According to the Berkeley version of Psalm 19.7, quote, The law of the Lord, Lord, the law of the Lord, my love it. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. Instead of being a form of bondage, God's law is for us the condition of life. Let us analyze the meaning of this. God's law as the condition of life. The condition of a fish is life. Its environment is water. Take a fish out of water and it dies. The condition of a tree is life. Its health and its environment is the soil. Uproot a tree and you kill it. It is no act of liberation to take a fish out of water or a tree out of the ground. Similarly, the condition of a man's life, the ground of man's moral, spiritual and physical health, is the law of God. To take men and societies out of the world of God's law is to sentence them to a decline, fall and death. Instead of liberation, it is execution Man's liberty is under God's law, and God's law is the life-giving air of man and society, the basic condition of their existence. When Moses summoned Israel to obey God's law and to walk by faith, he said, quote, I call heaven and earth to record against this, to record. A bit of a weak voice for God's voice, isn't it? I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Deuteronomy 30.19 Therefore choose life. And choosing life means living in obedience to God's law through faith in Jesus Christ, whose saving grace enables us to believe and obey. Law is, therefore, the condition of man's life, because God is the creator of life and the sole ground of its continuation. God's law is the essence of life and the terms of life. Those who tamper with God's law, or who espouse any departure from it, instead of seeking freedom to live, as they claim, are, in actuality, seeking death. For a fish, escape from water is an escape from life. It is a will to death. Jesus Christ, speaking as wisdom, ages ago declared, quote, But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. Proverbs 8.36 The hatred of God's law is the hatred of life. It is the love of death. True governments is government according to God's word in terms of his law as a ministry of justice, those who despise government are, according to Moses, Numbers 15, 29 to 31, and St. Peter, 2 Peter 2, 10, guilty of the sin of presumption. Presumption means taking for oneself authority and power for which one has no warrant or right. Whenever we set aside God's laws concerning life and death, we are guilty of presumption. Presumption is the mark of an unbeliever. Presumption means that we have set ourselves in the place of God and have demanded that life and death be on our terms only. The presumptuous humanists talk about reverence for life, but instead of having any regard for the sanctity of life, their view of life is secular and profane. Life for them has no connection with God. It is simply a natural resource to exploit and reshape to their own tastes. They are presumptuous, that is, self-willed. Their universe is essentially their own ego and their own intellectual pride, their confidence that they represent the elite ruling class of the ages. Their presumption makes them not only contemptuous of God, but of other men. We live in a day when the love of all men is insistently proclaimed in theory, and massive hatred of all men is practiced in fact we hear much about equality from men who tell us they are our superiors and therefore know what is best for us. We hear calls for unity from men whose every action divides us. Presumptuous men, because they are self-willed, can bring only anarchy. Faith and obedience bring unity because they unite men in Christ, not in man's will. 
except the Lord build a house, they labour in vain that build it. Psalm 127, 1. Okay, uh, we're going to end it there. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, it's nice to have you in the booth. I'm wearing this shirt, which is a bit too warm for the booth of truth. Booth of truth, the sauna of truth, perhaps. If you want to support this work, like, share, comment, message me. If you want to support it financially to help me to do more better, more better, with more stuff, more good stuff, more better mics, more better amplifiers, more better storage space to put all this stuff, more better hosting, all that kind of stuff, or just to show your appreciation, just, uh, yeah, uh, nathanteacher.com look for donations okay folks god bless and hope to see you soon ciao 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 ciao